<laughs> Viva La Vegan! Hi, I'm Lee Chantel from VivaLaVegan.net and today I have with me Anthea Amour and she's a vegan gourmet chef. You can find her at her website OrganicPassionCatering.com and today we're going to talk about her book and it's called Passion Organic Vegan Recipes to Live For. And Anthea, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Lee Chantel. How are you? Very good, thank you. Quite warm in our um, side of the world, isn't it, in Brisbane? And where, and where are you? We're in, uh, oh, I'm in Mullumbimby, so just near Byron Bay. And yeah, it's pretty hot here today. I've got the fan on and uh, not much more than a singlet top. <laughs> And so um, you've just released your book, and I was just saying to you before, I've seen it at quite a few of our health food stores in and around the Brisbane area. Can you tell me about the book? Yes. Um, I actually started writing it about 16, 17 years ago when I was living in the UK. I was working for a vegetarian vegan restaurant called Food for Friends in Brighton, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know why, I just got this idea, I really wanted to write a book, and I... I actually started writing the book in, uh, back then we didn't really do computers, so I <laughs> hand wrote the book in a big, thick exercise book and um, I'd forgotten how much of that book I'd written when I wrote this book and collated this book and toward the end of the collation of this book, I found that book and I pulled it out and I thought, because I remember brainstorming a few titles and a few chapter headings. Mm -hmm. So I picked up the book that I'd written 16 years ago or fleshed out and there in the book was a list of different titles but also what I found really interesting was all the chapter headings and the chapter headings were exactly what I'd put in this book 17 wow. years later. Um, so back then I was really interested in GMO and, um, and fair traded foods, going organic, veganism and spirituality veganism and the environment and all those key topics that I sort of briefly touch on at the beginning of Passion uh, were in this book that yeah. I had fleshed out before, long before GMOs were in the mainstream media or in the mainstream consciousness even um, and Fair Traded too for that matter was you know even quite young and, and new back then too so yeah I just I guess it was a collection of recipes and inspirations and food that I've been creating on and off over the years. Mm. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm I'm vegan, so I always wanted to do an organic. And organic for me, those two things are key, important. A lot of people are vegan, but not so much organic. But my passion lies in the two yeah. um, aspects. And of why why is it important to be organic or to have as many organic products as you can? Well, I think that organic food tends to be, when it's grown, the farmers tend to grow in smaller amounts. Mm -hmm. They also tend to um, use um, different, more natural methods of farming. So they're not using pesticides and herbicides and other chemicals in the growing and the maintaining of the land. They tend to work a bit more in harmony with nature, which for me is important. And also, I'm I'm been eating organic since I was 17. Mm. It's a choice I made ethically because it felt the most environmental thing to do. It felt good for my body not to be putting chemicals and pesticides in. So it's just something that's been a part of my life pretty much since I've become a you know as a young adult. Mm -hmm. And even more so over the years, I've just got more and more passionate about organic and ethical and really recognise that I have so much power in the way I consume and buy things. And I, I, I started to really um, watch that in the last 10 or 15 years and food is the easiest way that we can do that on a daily basis. We can choose not to poison the planet um, you know, by, by choosing organic. So for me, it's, just, it's a natural consequence of an extension of my ethics, I guess. Mm -hmm. And you've said um, with, with the book, you've got healthy, 10% or 100%, sorry, vegan, 98% are gluten-free, 10% sugar-free, and you've got 60% raw living food of all the recipes that you've got. Why are those sort of things important? Why is gluten-free important? Why is raw food important? Because they seem to be 
um, the in sort of words at the moment, don't they? Along with vegan and sugar free. So, yeah. um, and if you know, you had these sort of ideas years and years ago. How it, sometimes it feels like we're seers, doesn't it? Of like the future, like this is how it should be. When's everyone else going to, you know, catch up with us? <laughs> and I'm so excited everybody's catching up. Yeah. Because, you know, for so long I think I've been like probably like yourself, a bit of a a bit of a freak in my circle of friends and family or a bit different. I say and... left of centre. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm pretty way left of centre actually. So, yeah, and I actually don't mind that. I'm an Aquarian, so I don't mind being left of centre. It feels quite comfortable in my being. But, but yeah, these, thank God these words are becoming um, common. Uh, mm -hmm. That gluten-free, I think, you know, there's, there's particularly, that's probably bigger than, well, it's definitely bigger than vegan from what I can see in mainstream because yes. I can go anywhere and see a gluten-free cake in a cabinet of a cafe, but I'm still not seeing vegan. Mm -hmm, that's true. You know, in your average cafe, and I love vegan cakes. You know, so, yeah, definitely. Um, Who doesn't? There's something wrong yeah. with you if you don't. <laughs> Unless you go out to, um, you know, like a, an already vegetarian or whatever cafe. But, yeah, so so um, gluten-free is big because people are becoming intolerant to wheat. Mm. Um, is is uh, originally one of the original or is the original GMO crop. That's so um, it, um, it's already been tampered with. Uh, I know that a lot of people who are gluten-free, for example, when they go to Italy or France to eat the bread, they can actually eat the bread there. Oh, wow. But they can't eat the bread here, and part of that, I think, is because we don't really proof our breads like they do in the traditional methods, which they still do in France and Italy. They make good bread. You know, I'm talking your average boulangerie or, uh, you know, bakery or whatever. So they do proof the breads, and um, what happens in that process is the wheat pre-digests itself and starts mm -hmm. to break itself down and becomes way more digestible. So... Um, yeah, we don't really do that in Australia, I think, which is why we have so many gluten intolerant people. Um, so I've my uh, what, the way I cook is mostly gluten free, mm. but um, sometimes I do use wheat, sometimes I do use bread. But I've tried to give um, alternative options. There's the two recipes in the book that aren't gluten free. Use barley, the grain barley, okay. which is strictly not gluten free, but quite low in gluten. And some people mm. who are intolerant are fine. Celiacs often aren't necessarily fine. But um, I didn't write this in the book, but you can substitute barley for quinoa or rice or some other grain yep. in the soup. It's just not quite the same, but it's just different. But um, yeah, so I thought it's important to give people a book that they can find healthy recipes for their friends or their family who are struggling to digest gluten or are dairy intolerant mm -hmm. uh, or who are already vegetarian and vegan for all the obvious animal <coughs> reasons or environmental reasons or health reasons. So, and, yeah. And what about the living food or the raw food? That seems massive at the moment too. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's certainly really just starting to tip into mainstream. When I saw it in the Gourmet Traveller a few months ago, I thought, cool, it's even, you know, like super food, mainstream food magazine like Gourmet Traveller. So I thought, oh, that, that really excited me when I saw that. Cool. But yeah, for me, I've been into it for 10 or so years, um, slowly incorporating more and more raw foods in my life. I, I'm not 100% raw at all, but I just love to have... Being a vegan, I'm very um, conscious of my nutrition and health. Obviously, health anyway is my interest. So having foods that are really rich in nutrition and, and high in vitamins and minerals is just really important to me. And I've tried to make them as tasty and as accessible for everyone. Um, that's why you'll see quite a few of my desserts and sweet treats are raw um, uh, and, and living. Uh, so... Because I find that's a great way to show people that it can be really delicious. Mm -hmm. And probably in my next book, I'll I'll explore a bit more of the savoury. There is some savoury in there. There's the kelp noodle, Asian kelp noodle dish, and there's a couple of raw soups in there. And of course, most salads without mm -hmm. grains are raw. And so, yeah, I think it's just great to get more nutrition into our daily diet. Um, yeah, I think our soils are, are more depleted, you know, these days than they were, say, 50 years ago. Uh, so we're not getting as many minerals and nutrition from our food as we did once upon a time. So, 
you know, my theory is to jam pack it in there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this is a 216 page full colour book and one of the things that I really love about this book, you've got over 100 recipes and you have a photo for every recipe which I think is extremely important but so many people who write books seem to miss this little thing, don't they? <laughs> I couldn't do that. I, I'm such a visual person and 17 years ago when I remember googling to see what was on Amazon at the time for vegan recipes um, I was looking at titles of what, how other people were titling their books at the time and, and I counted there was 250 vegetarian and vegan recipes at that time on Amazon. I'm not sure what there are now but we must be getting close to a thousand I'm sure. I'd say so, or, definitely. Um, so yeah and uh, every book I ordered off Amazon back then for inspiration had no pictures. Mm. And I was like, I'm such a visual person and I still look at magazines like Gourmet Traveller and Delicious and some of those other Australian magazines. I still flick through them but I just picture everything vegan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, because I love that, I love to see how people plate things up and I love to see uh, how things are being garnished and how things are being layered or constructed. Um, and you don't get a, a huge amount of that. I mean, more and more these days you are. You're getting a lot of vegetarian and vegan books with pictures. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I couldn't not do a book with a picture on every page because I hate that when you've got pictures of some and they're not for others and you yes. look at them, you think, I want to make that recipe, but I don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So you tend to go for the pictures, the recipes that have the pictures. So <laughs> I didn't want to limit my... Um, future readers or future cookers. Um, so I put, yeah, a recipe for every every recipe, a photo for every recipe, sorry. Good, I love it. And yeah. um, some of the some of the recipes you have, beetroot and lime gazpacho, sang choy bao with crispy tempeh, savoury millet patties with sweet beetroot and caraway relish, chock salted hazelnut fudge, raw mini lemon and blueberry cheesecakes, so many different things here. I, in particular, am obsessed with tempeh, so I love that photo on the front. What's what's that recipe? I forgot the name of that one. It's the Indonesian-inspired gado gado. And, mm. yeah, tempeh is one of those things um, that people can be a bit scared to cook with. And I, I wanted to do something that looked a little bit mainstream. Like, some people have said they thought it was salmon or, or oh. trout or something else like that. I mean, yeah. I don't. It just looks like tempeh to me, but that's true. Uh, I can see that, like maybe breaded fish or something yeah, breaded, could, yeah, yeah, something like that. But I just thought I wanted something to look like it could have been a meat dish, but not. Yeah. Um, so that would attract people, regardless of what it actually was. I wanted to do something that was attractive, and mm. um, and and tempeh too, because it, it's. I guess it's a very crucial, important um thing in a in a vegan diet. You know to to get, uh, you know, protein and different vitamins and minerals. I mean, it's so good for you, tempeh. So, mm. yeah. And there's a few recipes in the book with tempeh in it. I don't do that much on tofu. Tofu's had such a bad rap in the last few years. And, yeah, I don't do too much. But, yeah, I think you mentioned same chap hour with crispy tempeh. Yeah. That's that photo nice. there. And it's, um, you know, the sanctuary bow and the beautiful um, fresh iceberg lettuce. Or I use any lettuce, really. Yeah. Like, I can't always get organic iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's not commonly grown organic lettuce. So oh. I just use whatever my local growers have. And, um, you know, whether that's the mini cods or the gem lettuce works well because it's got a bit of a cup shake, mm -hmm. shape. But I've also done it with um, just, you know, fancy frilly lettuces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just pop, pop the, you know, pop the tempeh and the rice on top and wrap it up and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any a favourite recipe or a few favourites that you really love to make? Um, look, you know, to be honest, I am such a simple, lazy cook. Mm -hmm. I, I really do live on a lot of steamed vegetables in the winter time, and then I just interchange fresh herbs and lemon juice, lime juice, toasted sesame oil, olive oil, bit of tamari. They're my very standard recipes. I also live on um, Thai, through the winter that is um, um, like a Thai laksa type, you know, because I love anything fresh and crunchy yeah. and, um, and then I just interchange my grains or noodles with that 
Um, and this time of year, of course, I'm living on salads and burgers. Um, in terms of the book, um, I, I don't know how to choose favourites. <laughs> it's always hard. <laughs> They're all my creations and I, I love them all for different reasons and it just depends on the people and the time and, mm -hmm. yeah. So and what, I'm what sure. about what are other people's favourites in the book, or what's the one thing that you would make if you have a lot of people coming over? Uh, I've had a lot of people comment on the Azuki bean and sweet potato burger. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Oh, yeah. uh, lots of people have commented on that. Um, lots of people have made. Um, you know, the millet, the Moroccan millet slice topped with roast pumpkin and the artichoke. What page is that? Uh, that's on page 138. It's a photo. But... So, yeah, that's like a millet slice. And I think it's because mm. most people are frightened to use millet. They yeah. don't know how to use it. So it sounds kind of... scary, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, but it, it's really not scary. And it's, it's the most alkaline in grain. It's really digestible. It's got B17 in it, which is anti-cancer. So there's so many reasons to eat it, which is why I put, I think I put two or three recipes in the book. Um, I don't know what to recommend. That's, I mean, I, like I said, fun. I love the laksa. Yeah. I think people, yeah, they can have a look through. Um, oh, you've got a few things online, don't you, on your website? On uh, um, organicpassioncatering.com. Yep, there's a few bits and pieces on there. I'm just about to rehaul my website, so um, oh, cool. yeah, it'll change probably early in the year. It'll change. But, yeah, um, I mean, this time of year, I'm definitely going for salads. I love mm. green fire salads. Nice. It's a nice Thai. But mm -hmm. I use macadamias instead of peanuts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The thanks to our bow is another favourite for this time of year for me. Yeah, it's, it's sort know, of an can, easy one, isn't it? Yeah, you just it's a bit of a stir fry of um, little crispy tempeh bits and then rice and then a bit of coriander, spring onion, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. lots of lime juice, coconut oil, sesame seeds. And, you know, you just kind of stir fry it up. And I add fresh peas or the last month or so I've been using broad beans, mm -hmm. fresh peas, broad beans, something fresh and green in there to sort of create another texture than the crispy tempeh and the soft fluffy rice but uh, Good. yeah I um I was just going to go through what you've got on the in the um index I guess um you've got the recipes and you also have your philosophy about organic healthy cooking and ca and eating which we sort of mentioned before you talk about ethics of food choices organic veganism and the environment fresh and local farmers, fair trade and GMO, which is genetically mo modified organism free. Um, you've also got a pantry list and you've got a glossary and nutritional tips. Why did you feel that it was um, important to put it in your philosophy about eating and cooking? Uh, because food is such a powerful way that everyone can have an impact on the planet. And I think Australian people are starting to really understand that. I think we've been slow to understand fair trade. Mm -hmm. Fair trade isn't that big in our supermarkets, whereas when you go to Europe, I've spent a lot of time living in Europe, and when you go there, there's much more awareness about things like fair trade and GMO. A lot of the, I think all of the supermarkets in, um, in England went, went GMO free 10 years ago when it first came out, whereas wow. I don't think any of our supermarkets have stood up and said that, or maybe one or two of them have, but I'm not I'm not too up on supermarkets because I, I live out of health food shops <laughs> and uh, co-ops. Uh, I help run a, a food co-op here in Byron, so um, yeah, I tend to buy all my food bulk and uh, from health food shops. So. Do you think it's because in Australia we just simply just don't have enough of a population? Like I find Europe, England, even America are sort of on top of the GMO a bit or it's, you know, people are getting to know about it at least. But in Australia it doesn't really seem to be a massive issue. I think it's our media. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I think our media is controlling what this, the average Australian person is seeing. I mean, certainly if you get on online, you, you know, you just have to put in GMO, and we've got we've got some great chefs in Australia who've really tried to stand up and speak out against GMO. There's a whole um, 
organisation of just chefs around Australia, and I'm talking some of the bigger names. Don't ask me to list them. I'm not sure who they are, but because I signed up to it ages ago. Um, um, <laughs> gee, oh, what is it? I don't know. Chefs Against Dream. I actually got them in my news feed because I. Um, I really like getting information on, you know, the latest information on GMI. So I do have it in my news feed, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly. But I reckon if you just Google Australian chefs against GMO, mm -hmm. if that could be what it's called. Um, I'll have a look. You'll come up with those guys. They're on Facebook and, and uh, I'm sure they've got a web presence, of course, as well. So there's definitely a lot of people um, raising the issues in Australia, whether or not the majority of people are seeing that is another story. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, the labelling laws in Australia, mm -hmm. um, you know, we we don't have to label our food whether it, something contains GMO or not, whereas in the UK, I'm not sure about the States, but definitely in the UK, everything has to be labelled. If, if a product contains any ingredients with GMO, it has to mm -hmm. be labelled. So then at least the consumer has the choice of whether they want yes. to, to take on... Um, GMO foods into their body or not, or support that or not. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, Australia is really behind. Uh, I've spent a bit of time lobbying and signing petitions over the last 20 years. Mm, the first petition I signed was 20 years ago about it. And um, yeah, I think it's just a very important. We don't know what GMOs are going to do to our bodies. Um, you know, it's a bit like letting Pandora out of the box mm. once it comes out. We don't really know the effect it's going to have on the land uh, and on different plant species. So for me, it's like don't tamper with nature. Yeah. Mother Nature's so perfect. I don't <laughs> understand the mentality around getting something that's absolutely perfect and trying to make it better. Um, I think it's just a control thing. I think like with people in general, they just want to control things that they can't. So as much as they can, like whether it's the weather or food or animals or the environment like I see especially over the past 20 years people are just trying to control things more and more and more and that seems to have not worked in our favor <laughs> yeah no in many areas it has a, it definitely hasn't worked in our favor because no. you know food is, food is such a crucial it's a daily ritual we all mm. enjoy it's there's so much celebration that happens around yeah. food it's not just there to sustain us but we celebrate every major event in our lives is usually celebrated around food mm. um, and it's such an important integral part of our lives I, that's why I put the word organic as well as vegan on the front cover of my mm -hmm. book because I wanted to say you know this is re these two things are really important in terms of if you want to really be an environmental mm. activist um, you know then really organic GMO, fair trader, these are all crucial things to consider when you buy anything. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and of course, I've been so passionate about vegan. We've called it, kind of haven't spoken that much about it, but <laughs> you know, I, I did become vegan at sort of 17, 18, uh, and I've been strictly vegan ever since. And um, for me, I started off from the animal point of view and also from the health point of view that our bodies weren't really designed to eat meat. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, as the years went on, I started to look and do research and then the whole environmental aspect started to come in quite strong. I remember reading Diet for a New Planet by um, John, uh, John Robbins and um, that, that was quite significant in really getting me on the page environmentally. I hear a uh, lot of people say that. I've heard that from so many people. Mm. It was a life-changing book, I think, he wrote and no one else was writing specifically about that that was getting into popular culture or mm, even culture back then. There might have been people writing about it, but it wasn't getting out. But mm. that book got out, you know. Mm -hmm. It got banned in Australia, I think. Oh, wow. Like, or maybe it was a DVD that got banned in Australia and an <laughs> American friend of mine smuggled it in and, <laughs> and um, we, we hosted a video night at my house and a whole bunch of <laughs> hippies and vegans and vegos turned up and, you know, we watched it there. But... um. <laughs> So I think it was actually banned, which is why I didn't get to Australia. I don't know if it's banned now, but... Um, I don't think so now. Yeah, and then I read the book. Once I saw the movie, I then read the book. And um, so, yeah, for me it became quite strongly and quickly environmental mm -hmm. some 18 years ago. I mean, it was a long time ago before people were sort of mentioning the environment. And finally it's coming out now uh, with Cowspiracy, which I mm -hmm. haven't seen. Um, it's but good. 
somebody's promised me a copy and um and yeah just finally it's getting out that the impact that animal rearing has on the planet on an environmental level is is massive mm. you know i think cowspiracy says it's the thing yeah. that is causing co2 emissions to rise yeah. and sort of the dirty word in the environmental movement that you know associations like greenpeace and um some of the other big ones won't even touch it yeah definitely but, but so, I, I can un like you know i don't agree with it obviously but i can understand their their whole thing is based on getting people to give them money and a lot of people you know would prefer to give money or donate or something so they don't have to change anything in their life and they think, oh, yeah, we're giving money to Greenpeace, so I don't have to become vegan, I don't have to get a better car, I don't, I don't have to use public transport. So yeah. I think it's hard for them to say these things, hey, you can like really empower yourself and change the world instead of doing it through us, you know? <laughs> it's a hard well, one. And that's the message I guess I'm trying to get across when okay. I cater for retreats or weddings or functions, if I get the chance to talk with people, that's the topic that will come up. You know, people say, why, why have you been so into organic or why did you become vegan? Or, and, and, the, and the environmental factor, I mean, the animal factor is big for me. It's, mm. I, and people say, do you think you'll always be vegan? I'm like, I can't imagine ever eating an animal. I just no. sit here and be you know, they're beautiful creatures and, and you probably, you know, my favourite part in the book um, uh, you'll you'll know these guys pretty well. Is uh, Lily, Davy, and, and you know at least my favourite page in the whole book is. What page is that? Uh, that's right at the beginning. It's not actually page numbered, but it's oh. just up. Uh, it's just after the ethics bit. Oh, and cool. um, see, um, you know, because we have a mutual oh, friend, yeah. Cody, who has our place on Earth, um, and she's a passionate vegan and. And it's got her animals there that um, that she's rescued from various places, and I've I've met them all. Yeah, we've loved... spent time with all of them, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. So um, I I wanted to tell them and all the other animals that you know often when I drive past a cow, and this is going to be the hippie freaky side of me coming out now, but I'll often say to a cow, I don't need animals, or I'll sing that mountain. <laughs> song from the 60s, I don't need animals because I love them, you see, I don't need animals, I want nothing dead in me. <laughs> oh, I don't know that, that's cute. Oh yeah, Melanie from the 60s, um, she wrote that song, if you oh. just Google Melanie and I don't need animals, yeah. um, you'll, you'll come up with that song and um, I've been singing it for 20 something years since I was a young hippie and, uh, <laughs> and when I go past cows I always say, I don't need you guys, <laughs> not safe around me. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so I have a passion for that, and, and that is my favourite bit in the book is cool. is seeing those guys in there. But yeah, we love them. Yeah. And um, so you sort of mentioned it before, um, um, and I said in the intro that you're a vegan gourmet chef. So what exactly is gourmet vegan cooking? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> for me, it's about making food a little fancy. Um, you know, I try to plate things up and, and um, design things uh, similar to how you'd see in a mainstream cooking, cooking magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to make food look attractive and appealing. Yep. Um, and I think it's using quality ingredients, um, uh, using maybe some slightly more complex ingredients like, um, oh, I don't know, cacao butter or... Mm. Uh, I don't know what makes it in gourmet. I don't. I don't even know why I use that term. I guess it's sort of it's a way of defining myself away from what was typically um, prepared and created in the eighties and even the nineties to a degree, which was a very stodgy vegetarian kind mm. of heavy lasagnas yeah. with like cheeses and yep. and nut loaves and things that were kind of heavy. I I tend to move along and help to try and inspire more creative ways of eating, healthier ways of eating, um, and, you know, fat, slightly fancier ways of eating. Um, you know, like I went to a lo one of our local restaurants here not that long ago, Harvest Cafe, and they've now got a vegan option on the menu, which cool. I always love. And it was just char-grilled cauliflower, you know, like I love making vegetables that have a bad name sexy. <laughs> you know, like cauliflower people or Brussels sprouts. 
And they had both those. I think they had char-grilled uh, or was it fried cauliflower and fried um, Brussels sprouts in mm. the salad with a celeriac puree and something else. So it's like taking these traditional dishes and mm. giving them a more modern, more contemporary spin, something that keeps a bit of nutrition, like when you char-grill... Like, I love char-grilled cauliflower. Mm. You know, you could serve me a bowl of char-grilled cauliflower and pour just a simple lemon tahini sauce over the top and throw in a handful of coriander or mint or whatever herb and I'll just eat that. You know, like, that's just gourmet to me. But, yes, yeah, so I think it's about turning um, vegetables into something a bit more interesting, a bit more sexy than just, you know... I mean, vegetables have taken the side parts... Of a, of a meat centre, you know, meat is always the centre of a stage in a mm, traditional, a people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like gourmet traveller or any of those big magazines, it's always the meat with the veggies on the side. Mm. And, um, you know, I think it's given veggies a bad name. People think, what do you eat? Like, just yeah. that bit, get on the side? Yeah. And I'm like, uh, no. You know, like, and so creating recipes out of whole vegetables and grains. Mm. And even yeah. when people, like I know a few of my friends who are taught, like um, professionally trained chefs, they, when they're learning that, they're not taught how to prepare vegetables properly other than as a side dish, like you said, or as a garnish. And yeah. you, you yourself, you're self-taught, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm self-taught because um, while there may be courses to become a vegan chef out there now, certainly 20 eight years ago, uh, or when I when did I start cooking professionally, I guess you could probably say I was like maybe 20 or something, <laughs> start to cook professionally, you know, there was nothing like that around 22 years ago. So yeah, I'm self-taught, I started when I was young, I became vegetarian at 14 and, <laughs> and my mum would just give me, you know, no, no disrespect to her, but would just give me the meat minus the vet, you know, the, the veg minus the meat, sorry. Same with mine, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I was like, I'm not getting all my vitamins here. So <laughs> I started to make lentil burgers and oh, cool. you know, other things from a young age because I was aware that I had to substitute. Yeah. You know, and, and make sure I got a variety, not just vegetables. Also, it was boring, you know. Yes. I'd grown up in an Italian family mm. um, where food, you know, a lot of the traditional peasant foods don't have a lot of meat, mm. um, you know, through all through Asia, even, yeah, definitely. Through, um, you know, Europe and even South America. It's not full of meat like mm. we have at West now. There was a lot of, you know, polenta and mm. things that, you know, they were just staples in a in a Sicilian diet. So, yeah, I guess when they I... they made veggies sexy back then, even though they were very simple. Maybe they didn't look that sexy, but they you know they tasted good. Mm, definitely, I know so. like, when I go to Asia, in particular Indonesia, and because I love tempeh, especially Indonesian fresh tempeh, and yeah. people are so like it it's really bizarre for most people to think some white person comes in and wants to eat all this pauper food and they just find it really bizarre and hard to comprehend because then they're all lining up for all the you know multinational um eastern uh companies that sell rubbish to to everyone so it's yeah it's a hard one for them to comprehend oh and the indonesian diet is is so it's it's got a lot of complexity in the mm. flavors, um, but it's got a lot of fresh. You know, they use bean sprouts and they use a lot of different Asian spinaches and, um, and you know, it's quite a healthy and... cuisine. Generally, yeah. it, maybe until the West got involved because they do eat a lot of duck and pork now. But mm. once upon a time, you know, there was a lot more vegetable orientated dishes. Mm. Uh, I mm. guess it's because that's what they grew and. And, um, you know, Indonesia was quite poor, or mm. Bali, I keep thinking Bali, I don't actually know Indonesia that well, but mm. Mm. Um, I spent some time in Bali and, and loved the traditional Balinese mm. cuisine, mm. you know, all the fresh coconutty curries and, yeah, and tempeh, I mean, mm. I love Indonesian tempeh. Nothing better, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, but we have a few in Australia, we certainly have a few local, locally made tempehs here in the Byron area that are that are just as good. They're superb. Yeah. And that wonderful brand on the Sunshine Coast, Mighty Bean. Oh, they're good too, yeah. They, that's the closest thing you'll get to a traditional mm -hmm. uh, made tempeh. And I, I love their, their tempeh sensational. Mm -hmm. 
And there's one in Brisbane too called Totally Tempe. My friend um, Lara has that and her partner, he's Indonesian. So she, yeah, she knows what it should taste like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're good as well. You have pasteurized tempe, which is tempe that's had been treated by heat, mm -hmm. which is a traditional method. Traditionally, it's left to ferment and grow in the bag. You'll often see in the stalls in, in um, Bali, you know, all these bits of, it looks pretty bad, but all these tempeh, like um, fermented soybeans tied up in plastic bags. And, um, and uh, you know, so, you know, having it fresh and not treated by heat is, is a whole different experience to when you buy a pasteurized tempeh, um, which doesn't taste anything no, like the, it's really, it's like more like a nut meat mm. texture, you know, it's kind of claggy and... Whereas tempeh itself is quite light, you know. And, um, I yeah. remember when yeah. I first went to Indonesia and I saw their tempeh like in the shops and it's just like white covered with um, banana leaves. And I'm like, why is your tempeh yeah. white? Because <laughs> yeah. ours is brown over here. So I yeah. thought there was something wrong with that, but that's how it's meant to be. And it's, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's the traditional um, culture on the outside, the, the sort of, I guess it's like a controlled mould. Yes. But I don't want to use that word and freak people out, but, you know, if you think cheese is a con used controlled mould techniques, mm. then it's the same sort of, Pretty you know, that control the mould to um, to get that lovely fermented quality, which mm. we're all lacking in our diet these days. You know, that reminds me of fermented food. That's mm. another thing taking off right now. Oh, yeah. You know, and building in our guts um, great live bacteria, and, and that's what tempeh does. Mm. It, it has a great uh, live bacteria that um, that is really good for us. You know, like miso, you know, unpasteurized mm -hmm. miso, miso that's not been treated by heat. Mm -hmm. But you've got to look out for unpasteurized miso and unpasteurized tempeh mm -hmm. um, to get the benefits. Otherwise, you're really not getting, uh, I don't know if you get any, but you certainly don't get hardly any. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And so you've cooked in many places, in the UK, in Europe, you cooked for a while at um, the Santos store in Byron, which is a very well-known health food store in Byron Bay in Australia. Um, you've catered for many years um, with your husband, Casper, and yes. um, he's, he's the one who's done the painting behind um, Anthea, if you can see it, that's done by Casper Brace. And um, now you're on to catering for retreats, functions, weddings, and our mutual friend Holly and her partner Tim, they just got married and you catered for that, small world. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, it is a small world. Uh, yeah, I absolutely adore catering for weddings because I get to kind of play around and um, create fancy vegan food. And I also get to access some of like mainstream Australian you know, particularly meat-eating families, mm. and, you know, they've got, might have these daughters or sons who are kind of weird and vegetarian <laughs> or vegan, and suddenly I'm catering a whole wedding where, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people are not vegetarian yeah. or vegan. Definitely. Um, so I get access in a fancy setting, so I get to really show off and show how amazing vegan food can be, mm -hmm. and the most common um, feedback I get is, Wow, this is incredible. I can't believe vegan food could be this good. I would become vegan if I could eat this every day. I mean, these comments I get all the time. Yeah. And people are shocked. There's actually shock and awe on their faces. And I, I really love that. I love, and I always tailor a menu to those people. Yes. I've always got those people in mind who. I want it to be accessible, so I don't want it to be too weird. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I'm going to do tempeh, I'm going to fry it. You know, mm, I'm going to yeah. make it crispy. I'm going to batter it. I'm, you know, I'm going to make it a bit more interesting. Cool. Uh, yeah. And because to, to break down some of those preconceived ideas that vegan is lettuce leaves, lentils and sprouts mm. or, you know, like that vegan is somehow limiting or boring is total opposite and I really shatter those beliefs you know, in large groups of people at a wedding. Yeah, that's uh, great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I really, I, I take real pleasure in catering for weddings and don't do enough of them because mm. a lot of couples, you know, don't necessarily brave their beliefs and um, mm. subject them to <laughs> others, whereas I don't see the subjecting. I see no. the opening a beautiful Educating. new mm. Yeah, to show people that vegan food can be awesome. Mm. 
<laughs> so if you'd like to hire Anthea to cater for your wedding or for your function or a retreat, make sure you check out her website, organicpassioncatering.com, and she's also on Facebook. And um, make sure you check out her book as well. It's Passion, Organic Vegan Recipes to Live For. And the, you can find drinks, breakfast, soups, salads, starters, tasting plates, lunch, dinner, sweet treats, and desserts there. You can buy this online at the website, selected bookstores, health food stores in particular, where I've seen it a lot, and some online bookstores. And um, thank you very much for joining us today, Anthea. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Happy cooking, everyone. Get <laughs> healthy. Get vegan. <laughs> exactly. And if you'd like to see more interviews and listen to more interviews with inspiring vegans, make sure you check out vivalavegan.net. Thank you. Thank you.